Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, I want to talk to you about a series of unfortunate rocket failures, which were all linked together into a larger narrative of accidents, poor choices, and simple bad luck for everybody involved. Our story starts out with a communications satellite named Superbird B or Superbird 2. This was intended to deliver satellite TV from a slot above the Eastern Pacific. It was a two and a half ton spacecraft built by Ford Aerospace. Yes, Ford used to build satellites. It was being built at a facility in Palo Alto, California in 1989 with a plan to launch on the relatively new Ariane 4 rocket which had debuted the previous year and allowed the final flights of Ariane 2 and 3 in 1989. Now if you were in Palo Alto in 1989 there was one big event that you probably remembered. On October 17th the Loma Prieta earthquake struck the Bay Area causing damage all over the place. This was a decade before I started living here but my wife remembers the quake and its aftermath well and talks about it often. Now the quake caused minor damage to the satellite which meant that it wasn't going to be ready in time for its planned launch. And this was somewhat problematic because it was going to share a launch with another satellite called BS-2X which would have to then wait. But for Ariane Space they had another payload that was ready to go sooner, the French Spot 2 satellite. And it also was with a number of other small amateur radio satellites. So they took this payload and reassigned the booster that was assigned to Superbird and gave it to Spot 2. And uh, this mission then launched in January of 1990. Then in February, a month later, both communication satellites were mated on top of an Ariane 4, which needed four extra strap-on liquid boosters so that it would be able to reach the required geostationary transfer orbit. Countdown went as planned, but as the vehicle began to rise up off the pad, the temperatures in one of the engine's turbines rapidly exceeded operating limits. The thrust dropped off and very quickly the engine essentially shut down. You can actually see this missing engine in the this video of the launch. You can see the missing exhaust and as the rocket moves up, it starts to slip sideways coming really close to the launch tower. We actually see the rocket exhaust blasting the top of that tower. Now that missing engine meant that it had lost one eighth of the normal thrust, but it actually still had enough thrust to weight ratio to lift it up and let it ascend and accelerate up toward, you know, supersonic speeds. But I think at this point, engineers and mission control didn't think there was much hope of this vehicle reaching orbit, but it might at least get far enough away from the launch site so that it didn't dump debris and those toxic hypergolic propellants all over the place. While it had enough thrust to fly, it didn't really have the control authority. Uh, the Ariane 4 has four engines each on a single axis gimbal, and with one engine missing, it actually had lost one degree of freedom in its control. Um, and also with the off-center thrust, the engine control system was uh, trying to counteract this. And it did so for about a minute or so before it eventually exceeded those capabilities and the vehicle lost control and was torn apart by aerodynamic forces, scattering debris over the nearby wetlands. But thankfully, most of the toxic propellant burned during that breakup. For the next few days, the French Foreign Legion would be tramping through the swampy terrain, collecting debris that might give them some clue as to what went wrong. In the end, they found the smoking gun in a section of piping from a Viking engine, which had some cloth stuffed into it. That wasn't supposed to be here. The Viking engine uses hypergolic propellants fed by a turbo pump, and the pump is driven by, by burning some fuel and oxidizer in a gas generator and using the exhaust from that to drive the turbines. But on its own, that exhaust gas would be too hot for the turbines. So they're cooled by spraying water into that exhaust so that the temperature drops. Now the cloth in that pipe was blocking the water flow, which meant the turbine very quickly overheated and didn't perform, thus killing the engine. I guess the fact that it was in a water pipe meant that it protected it against burning, for, you know, with all the flammable propellants, and that's how they were able to find this afterwards. The story about how the cloth got in there, well, I hear that was a technician that was working on connecting some plumbing that he'd had some trouble with, so he'd like repolished it and got it to fit, but he needed a supervisor to approve of this, so 
apparently he left his handkerchief in there. Um, it was a Friday night. There were no supervisors around, so he went home for the weekend and got sick. So somebody else came in Monday morning and completed the job that he had started, not noticing that there was a piece of cloth in this pipe. A cloth of doom, as you might say. So yes, uh, I'm not sure how truthful that is, but uh, I, I do believe it when I hear that these days when they're making engines, they uh, keep track of every single cloth by giving it a serial number. So look, it was a terrible bit of bad luck for Superbird, which survived an earthquake only to have its launch vehicle switched to one with a fatal flaw. On the other hand, it was a stroke of luck for Ariane Space, since the Spot 2 spacecraft was originally designated to fly on the doomed booster. Because it was going, uh, it was a smaller payload and going to a lower orbit, it wouldn't need those strap-on boosters. So if that had flown with the failed engine, it would have only had three working engines instead of seven, and the crash would have probably happened right on the pad, probably causing serious damage and a major cleanup situation with all the toxic propellant. But that is not the end of this story because Superbird's partner on this launch was another satellite called BS-2X. And again, that was another communication satellite. The operator, of course, had built two of these because it was quite common practice to have a backup satellite ready to go in case of a launch problem like this. After their unfortunate experience with Ariane, the satellite operator decided that they would switch over to an Atlas Centaur launch vehicle, a rocket which was returning to the fore as it became clear that the space shuttle was never going to be commercially viable. In April of 1991, Atlas AC-70 launched with the payload and it performed admirable, admirably, dropping its booster engines and then later releasing the Centaur upper stage. But the historically reliable Centaur suffered a problem with one of its engines failing to ignite and operate, and the other ended up spinning the stage out of control until it was de destroyed by the flight termination system. An investigation was started right away, but they didn't have any recovered hardware to investigate. They did have telemetry showed that they're showing that the turbo pump didn't speed up like it was supposed to. So they looked at the turbine inlet and the plumbing around the engines, and they did find something that they thought was problematic. Uh, so the turbines, they, they basically work like a high precision windmill. You, know, you blow food, a, f a fluid over the spinning structure that spins it. And it's in a pipe where the blades go right up against the edge. And you want that gap between the blades and the edge of the pipe to be as tight as possible because any gap means that you're losing efficiency. And of course, touching the walls means that you've got extra friction. But anything that can get stuck in that tiny gap can be a real drag. And that's really important in the RL10 engines because they have a very slow startup because they sort of rely on waste engine heat to boil hydrogen so that they can drive those pumps. So it doesn't take much friction in those turbines to slow or arrest the startup completely. So the engineers examined the engine fresh out of the factory and they found tiny fragments of plastic from scouring pads which were being used to clean the plumbing. And they concluded that these fragments had caused enough drag to stall the engine as it tried to start up. So the engine production procedures were then modified to require baking of all this plumbing hot enough to burn out any of the plastic fragments that might cause this problem. Confident in their solution, they prepared for the next launch. Over a year later, in August of 1992, this time it was carrying a Hughes Galaxy 1R satellite. Again, the booster performed admirably, and once again the Centaur had one engine fail, with the turbo pump failing to spin up, and the payload was lost. This was pretty embarrassing. Exactly the same failure. The original investigation had come to the wrong conclusion. Initially, they couldn't replicate the failed startup on the ground. It would take a stroke of luck to give them the insight needed. One day, having prepared the engine for a test run, the team broke for lunch, and when they came back, they replicated the failure to start. What had been happening was that the engine chill-down system would run cold helium through some parts of the engine to prepare it for the really cold liquid hydrogen. 
This helium would exhaust out through one-way check valves, but it turns out that these one-way valves weren't quite as one-way as expected under the operating conditions. So air would actually leak back in through these check valves and that air would liquefy at the temperature. In fact, at the temperature of liquid hydrogen, it could solidify and form nitrogen and oxygen ice. Not a lot, but enough to jam up the turbine. So the solution was then to replace the valves with better ones, which could stop backflow of air into the system. Problem solved then, right? Sure. It's just a shame that the next Atlas launch after that would also be a failure for a completely unrelated region, uh, uh, reason. A loose screw which resulted in the main engine underperforming. But you know, since then, Atlas had had a near perfect launch record. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.